We take a DNA sample for your identity. Parts I have. I mean, first of all, whatever the. I mean, I, I would actually disagree with that reading of Islamic history because actually there are instances within Islamic history, even going back to to the 15th century. And I actually looked into this when I was writing this paper, where people were tried, uh, Muslims were tried under Muslim uh, law for insulting the Prophet, and sometimes it was under, uh, often it was tried under, under the name of apostasy. Rida, right? Um, so uh, I'm not sure that when she says there is nothing called uh, blasphemy, actually there there are strong there there's there's not a ton of precedent, but there's some legal precedents for uh, for considering an act of insulting prophet as 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 litigable. In most instances, the people who were tried were not necessarily sentenced to death and so on. This is a very modern phenomenon that happens primarily. In in in, uh, in in Pakistan, where even the blasphemy laws in Pakistan were initially introduced by the British, and there's some very interesting work that's being done um, that it was colonial law that introduces the notion of blasphemy as litigable in in South Asia, which then becomes a part of the Pakistani legal code, and then in the Zial Hub it becomes promulgated as as blasphemy laws. But it has a very secular history, if you will. Um, so I'm not I'm, I, I, I'm not sure that this idea that you know that uh, I, I think it's true that of course Muhammad is very distinct from the concept of Jesus. He doesn't he's not the son of God. He does not share a divine essence, theologically speaking. But I think this idea that uh, regardless of what might uh, people like her say, the point is that Muslims do regard uh, Muhammad as a reverential presence. He, he his status is akin, I think, to to Mary rather than to Jesus, right? There's 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 a reverential there's a reverentiality to, for the figure of Muhammad with the understanding that there is he does not share the divine essence of God, and so the, and the, a lot of the literature that I'm talking about, the devotional literature for the Prophet, on the life of the Prophet, is in fact very much viewed by the mainstream Salafi tradition as folk tradition. And I think that's probably the view I would imagine that she is, she's echoing. And I would say to that that I mean, instead of saying they just have the wrong understanding of of Islam, I think it's a it's a different understanding of Islam, and it's very ubiquitous. <laughs> love songs, love poetry for the for the prophet, for for his family, and in fact, uh, I think it needs to be taken account of in terms of what religion is, rather than what it is that how it is not religious how it's incorrectly religious. Um, and this is a debate within the, within the Salafi and Sufi tradition, right? I mean, much of the Sufi tradition reveres the persona, persona of the Prophet and his family. And there's a ton of devotional literature among the Sufi, within Sufi poetry, Sufi music, that is aimed towards this. So there has been a long-standing conflict within, within Islam. Uh, and it's not just Wahhabi Islam, but it's the Salafi tradition of which Wahhabism is a shoot, offshoot, but it's not reducible to it. Salafism is not uh, reducible to Wahhabism. And there's a long-standing sort of debate about what is the status of Muhammad, what, how is he to be revered, and so on and so forth. So I would, I, I would take exception to that. And I think, uh, 
you know, the Islamist press, when I was reading it at the time when the cartoons were raging, I found it really curious that their perception was not that different from the European press, except they just mirrored the judgment. And their judgment, uh, they, they just echoed the sense that, you know, this was, this was about insulting our symbols. And so we got to insult your symbols. It's about identity politics. And very little, um, um, very little of what I'm describing and what was going on on the ground, in the grassroots, and the masses of people who were really upset about this without taking to the streets or thinking that the violence was, was a form of expression of this kind of an injury, very little of that found expression. Uh, in the Islamist press, and I think from precisely for the reason that you're talking about, because there is this understanding, oh, this is, this is we, we, can't, we can't really give expression to this. This neither maps onto the identity politics paradigm. And furthermore, it might as well be an aberration within Islam. Right? It is the folk practices of the Sufis and the so on and so forth. It's, yeah. Maybe follow-up question on the specific nature of cartoons bringing such... Uh, there only 12 years ago, so I don't remember it very well, but cartoons are often used, or almost exclusively used, in the political context of insulting your enemy. The first meaning that is attached by many, well, it was explained to me by people who live there, the first meaning... <laughs> there are many people who live there who perceive many different things. <laughs> Cartoons are, you know, I mean, the press, of course, there is very, very similar to the press anywhere in the world, right? Uh, it employs many of the same idioms, many of the same expressions. So I find it hard to think that cartoons have a cultural understanding that is specific to the Middle East press. But I do think um, what's at stake here is the issue of, the, of, of Muhammad. And I think that's what I'm trying to emphasize here. If you think about um, the publication of the Satanic Verses and the way in which people were upset about it, it was, they were far less upset about the verses, the Quranic verses. They were far more upset in the way that Muhammad was caricatured and ridiculed. And I do think that there's, there's something quite specific here. Um, which it has to do about one's relationship to Muhammad. In the way that, I mean, for example, at the same time as the cartoons were going on, um, there were other incidents in which a number of the symbols of Muslim faith were being derogated, uh, derogatorily, being insulted or treated in a derogatory manner. And one example of it was um, the, the, the Quran that was flushed down the toilets in, in, in Iraq at the same time. Uh, similarly, uh, 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 it, was, it, it was very widely reported. Uh, at the same time, there was Quran, uh, pages of the Quran at the end of, of the bayonets of, uh, and guns of American soldiers. Um, and there were pictures of it, um, it circulated very widely on the internet. You didn't have the same sense of injury expressed as what I'm talking about, and that's what, what I'm trying to track. Again, I want to emphasize often, I mean, this happened yesterday too, my talk is taken as if I'm offering an explanation for, for all the different kinds of reactions that occurred to the cartoons, and I'm not. I'm, there is a lot of good work on that, and I would direct you to that, and so on. My problem is quite simple and straightforward, which is to say there is a kind of relationality, there is a kind of moral injury that is at stake here that did not find expression either in the Islamist press, Islamic press, or the European press which is really, I think, crucial to getting an insight on what is at stake. And it could have been another incident. It doesn't have to be the cartoon incident. And I'm trying to think of what happens to this kind of injury when it's translated into language of the law, juridical claims. And do we have other mechanisms in societies which are interested in getting, getting across this impasse on how do we talk about it across religious traditions, across religious faiths, which while still respecting the protections that laws about religious freedom and laws about freedom of expression offer us. But they're not reducible to it. If you go to the 
others that liberals are critiquing Muslims for misreading images and the ways in which li liberals are misreading Muslims. Uh, so that at least in some instances what you have is it seems as if the liberal misreading of Muslims is the reading of them as themselves an image or an icon. So what happens in, in effect is that the, in the liberal misreading, right, is you have a confusion of subject and object. The Muslim, the sin of the Muslim is acting like a subject when it's meant to be an object in that liberal reading. Um, so I don't know if that's too slick a kind of interpretation, right? Or if uh, there's some, if you find that if there's something in there. Um, and then more generally what I'm wondering about is um, the question about liberalism itself. Because I'm, I'm, I listen to you and you have a critique of liberalism. Some of the time it's slightly outside of it uh, and then some of the time it's inside of it. And uh, what I imagine then when you say that it's not hypocritical but it's emerging out of the deep structures, traditions and so forth and logic of liberalism itself um, is it's in the interests of liberalism, your, your criticism of it. But I wonder if you try to do what you're trying to do, if it really is emerging out of the logic of liberalism itself, that it's blind to religion, won't you tear it apart? Isn't your project, and it would be so much easier if it was just hypocrisy. Right? Because you just call them hypocritical? Well, not just call them, but if the mistake of these liberals who are offering these, like Stanley Fish, you know, or, or uh, Tariq Ali, you know, the initial, uh, examples you gave, uh, that that's just a kind of superficial, an intellectual superficiality, right? That's much easier to correct than if the misreading of religion is coming out of the fundamental structures of uh, liberalism. Because then, in order for liberalism to read religion, to be, to see it, uh, it needs to be fundamentally reconstituted. And lots of things can't be. Did everybody hear the two questions? Compliments. <laughs> um, yeah, it's nice to see you after these many years. Um, I believe we met in 90, 2003? Yeah, four. Four, four. okay. <laughs> of course. <laughs> I would have put us in elementary school. But <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I want to make clear uh, that I'm not claiming that either Stanley Fish and people like Tariq Ali are blind to religion. In fact, my argument is they have a very normative conception of religion. And that is a very different argument. I'm not making the argument that people like Stanley Hauerwas have made, which is to say, who's this you know, a theologian and ethicist um, at Duke, who's very important to contemporary uh, rethinking of religion in, in secular liberal democratic societies. That's not the argument I'm making that they are blind to religion. I'm saying there's a deep normative conception of religion running through this discourse and they remain blind to the normative conception that they embody. So I want to be very clear, because I think if they're just blind, we can just educate them, I think, as you're saying. But if there is a, actually a normative conception of religion, and much of the you know, uh, contemporary uh, scholarship on secularism shows this over and over again, whether it's, it's people like Charles Taylor, who in fact wants to precisely spell out what is the normative conception of religion that is internal to secularism, that's what the topic of a secular age is. And he wants to tell liberals, whom he shares fundamentally and deeply with, to say, look, we have a positive conception of religion. Don't just let it be uh, uh, considered a negativity. And let's just define it, give it presence, give it shape, and then distinguish it of all, from all those other forms of religiosity that are non-secular religion. So I want to be very clear that that is something, is, is what I'm trying to track here. So it's not blindness. Uh, in fact, to say that it is blind is to buy into the arguments of people like Stanley Fish who say they have religion and we do not. And that's what I was trying to say when I said, um, in fact, it's, it's crucial to understand that you cannot take his claims on its own terms because in fact, there is something very deep and embedded here. And so let's understand what that deep embeddedness is. Um, I, the issue of, uh, I mean, I, I don't think the issue is just about religion. And this is what the thrust of the paper is. I think to just say, 
that liberalism is blind to religion or it doesn't really understand other kinds of religion is not to understand the far more deeper set of questions that are involved here, the questions about the, the, the role of the law, when it should intervene, in precisely, um, on, in, in precisely in issues that it on the one hand regards as private and on the other hand, it must continuously regulate in order to yield a secular democratic liberal order. So for example, um, and, and um, so there is a, it's a question about law, it's a question about language. I mean, this idea that you just said that there is a misreading, this is precisely what I'm trying to complicate. It's it, to think that language is about reading, is a communication of meaning is not to understand other ways in which language circulates. And again, much of the, I think there's some very interesting work that's being done on secularism, which tries to think through what it means to take this fundamental distinction between object and subject, which is considered to be the hallmark of modernity, all the way from you know critical theory tradition to people like Bruno Latour, I hope I don't break this all the time, uh, but um, that this is fundamental to modernity. Well. We have thought somewhat about what its consequences are for, for modernity through the Frankfurt School tradition, through the critical theory tradition, through more provocative writings of people like Bruno Latour. I think what is being rethought is what um, consequences does it have for the way that of the secular liberal imaginary? How do we think that? And one of the pieces of that rethinking is the, uh, about language. Does language to this idea that language primarily functions as a means of communication, hence this constant, I mean, anthropologists who used to look at practices suddenly under the, uh, with gears went to thinking about cultures as texts, right? A fundamental transformation of the anthropological project happens in that conjunction, right? We, so let me just finish. Uh, so I'm saying that this idea that it's about misreading, I want to unsettle this, right? The world is not just about reading. I mean, even the Deleuzian thrust of philosophy teaches us much about stepping aside from this idea of the world as text, language as communication, and beginning to think of other ways. You know, there are other, of course, linguistic philosophers who have made us think differently about language. J.L. Austin's work. Words do not simply mean they do something in the world, the speech act theory. Um, Wittgenstein's later work is very much about getting away from this idea that this language is about meaning and reading. So uh, I just want to really kind of make sure that those two points are not lost. This idea that, I, am I speaking from within liberalism or from without liberalism? I don't think I have a choice. I wish I had a choice. Um, I think we live in a certain hegemonic order in which the truth of liberalism is in fact more and more conceded there was a moment in, in the world where there was a different Mecca toward which we could have been headed, and that was the moment of high Marxism. And I think that has rede receded from us uh, consistently. Um, and uh, so I, I, I can a fish breathe out of water? I don't think so. Um, do I have to always accept the toxicity of the water? I don't think so. I think we need to think critically about it. So that, that's how I would think about some of the issues you're raising. Louder, please. I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, the clarification. Uh, what got me off with the, the, the question of being blind was you actually said mute about when, when is moral injury, injury legible and when is it mute. Uh, so I just shifted from mute to blind. Um, but I think there's a misunderstanding about what is mute. It's not religion that's mute. I'm talking about a particular kind of moral injury that is an enunciable and ju juridical language, which is not to say all religion is mute, all religious expression is mute. I want to be very clear about that. Right, which which I understand. Mm -hmm. But what I'm wondering is if you're coming at it from from the side of religion. Side of religion. What does that mean? Um, that is, if within a liberal secular system, uh, the the religious cannot certain components, aspects of the religious, for example, moral injury, certain kinds of moral injury, 
cannot be enunciated, cannot be made visible, heard, seen, valid. Um, <coughs> that, I don't know then if it matters um, whether it's, say, blindness or normativity. That normativity feels like blindness. At the moment, you're invisible within the system. You cannot, um, at the moment that, for example, you know, there are all those discussions also about can woman be enunciated in language, right? So at the moment that that, that thing, that other, cannot be enunciated within reigning hegemonic system norms and so forth, um, does it really matter if it's normativity that's making it invisible? Um, or you know, What else would you like to call it? Serious question, I mean, I, I'm intrigued. Well, I don't know, because what, what I'm wondering is, is the question about, is it normativity, or for example, is it uh, liberalism's own blindness to its own religiosity? Which, yeah, I mean, it's a whole long discussion. I'll get back. Yeah. I don't want to dominate the whole thing. Yes. I think the term to the law is needs to be thought through very carefully, and this is this is my fear that there is an attempt to really turn to the law from both sides of the divide, wherever you might stand, um, whether uh, to enable more freedoms or or restrict those freedoms. And um, and I, I, I partly the reason I'm working with this with this paradox is to say. The first of all, law is not a neutral mechanism, and so the question arises, can law's language could be expanded consistently to be able to yield something more? The religious sensibilities, and I, I, would, I would say that, I mean, I'm, I'm very skeptical of that, and the reason I'm skeptical of that is because it's not, again, because of the malfeasance sense of the law, but I think to immediately translate uh, questions of coexistence across lines of difference, whether it be sexual difference, racial difference, ethnic difference, religious difference, is to render the problem within the languages of the state, right? And, and the ethical dimensions of what it means to be able to transform a society so that it can really live with that kind of differences cannot just be promulgated by bylaws. And of course, we have many, many precedents of this, right? We think of the of this feminist struggle. Um, I'm thinking in the United States, case of the United States, the issues of, of sexual uh, harassment. Of course, the law helped. When the laws were passed in workplaces against sexual harassment, it was very enabling of women to be able to go to their employers and say that they were being sexually harassed in places of work. However, at the same time, to this day, sexual harassment remains very hard to prove. And it's very hard to fight it. And not only that, there has been a backlash. But aside from the backlash, I think the more important thing is that the reason sexual harassment uh, 
cases come to be, it, it, people become conscious of that, is through a kind of a political education. So the question, of course, arises that, you know, was the entire passage of the laws against sexual discrimination, sexual harassment, were precisely was the enabling mechanism by which people's consciousness was raised about this issue? Yes and no. If you think, of course, of, uh, of uh, civil rights legislation, it was crucial, of course, in the prevention eventually of lynching of black people in America, right? Of, of forcing um, se uh, desegregation of schools along racial lines and so on and so forth. By law, people were forced to bust their children to a cross. And of course, this was the force of the law through which these kinds of changes were produced. But again, that alone itself was not responsible for the transformation of the racial sensibilities of whites and blacks, right? Particularly white discrimination against Muslims. I mean, against, uh, <laughs> that is a Freudian slip. Um, uh, that, but, but particularly against the discrimination of whites against blacks. So I think uh, there are many, many instances we, think, we can think of the presence of Jews in Europe. And of course, anti-Semitic legislation was crucial, but it, there was a far larger transformation of ethical sensibilities of people, cultural sensibilities of the white uh, Christian majority towards reckoning with what happened, right? Which wasn't just the Holocaust, but was so much larger than the Holocaust. Um, and so that's partly what I'm trying to think through, is to say the immediate turn to the law in fact blinds us to something that is crucial to think with that is perhaps more negotiable. More, uh, the more that there is, I, I hate to say, I'm almost sounding like Habermas, but I don't want to, to turn it all into a communicative act. But, but, but I, I think there's something to be said about thinking about uh, forms of religiosity that should be engaged in this moment of intensive uh, uh, impasse that that can't be turned into claims of identity, that are not predicated on claims of identity and claims of the protection of the law. I mean, I, th I think perhaps even a, a far greater tension in international law is the tension between community rights and individual rights, which of course comes out of, of the genesis of the, of, of the Human Rights Declaration, UN Human Rights Declaration, which by the way, remember, is an American authored document, <laughs> which was, I mean, Eleanor Roosevelt wanted to strike out the, the very notion of community and the, any mention of community from the UN Declaration of Human Rights. And in, in fact, it is only retained in, in one clause. And mind you, the, the clause that actually ensures community rights is introduced very late. It is it's introduced in the 1960s for the first time, and it remains largely dormant. And it's only now that the debate about religious difference is raging uh, within Europe that there is a more of a consideration to, well, how do we think about community rights, right? So I, th I think that's, that's even a far greater tension. And I would just add, that I don't think it's just, again, I don't want to say that therefore secularism turns out to be Christian in origin or that it's really, whereas it says it's neutral towards religion, but it's really Christian because a very similar logic is at work. Yeah, yeah. So, correct, correct. No, but, but all I'm saying is that that language then is, is a problem that travel, travels across with the, with the uh, division of the, of the population into majority and minority groups. Well, Coming out. Yeah. <laughs> it's well. What I would like to to ask you is, is the following. Um, you know, even even if it's hardly possible for members of a particular religion to hook in in a strongly individualized uh, legal system, yeah, 
uh, it might be useful, and uh, Thomas Cannon pointed this out, it might be useful to, uh, to attempt to go to the court because of the, um, the public um, controversy that arises from this. Yeah? Given that I go to the court in order to get the same protection like Anglican members of the Anglican Church uh, because, um, uh, because blasphemy law so, I will be probably rejected like uh, Muslim um, were in, in the United Kingdom in the case of the Salman Rushdie affair. But there is public discourse about this. And people about are looking what, at I'm it. sorry? Uh, public discourse about the, uh, the inequality of the, uh, of the British law in this case. Or the European laws in this case. Or the European law in this case. And therefore, in my view, it's, it's even more important, important to look at the controversies about cartoons or books or whatever. And the book itself, or the cartoon itself, it's, but I'm not a Muslim and I'm, I'm in your view, pro and probably a liberal. Uh, it's not that relevant hey, to look at the cartoon. Hey, I just call myself a liberal, so how can yeah, I okay. <laughs> I hope um, some of my best friends are liberal. Right? Let's so, 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 just embrace liberalism in all its <laughs> So the impact, the impact of the of the discourse about the book or the cartoon is much higher, in my view, the impact of the discourse about this than the impact of the impact of the cartoon itself or of the book itself. So, in a sense, what you're advocating is that for Muslims to actually go to the law to, to show the inconsistency of the law in regards to their own grievances. Is that correct? Am I understanding you correct? Um, it's part of it's part of what was what I was trying to say. Yeah, but my point is that the, we have to look at the at the second step, as it were. So, what, what arises from the from the publication of the cartoon uh, and the, that civil friendship or civic duties or so. Are relevant not for the draw of the of the cartoon, or not at least uh, in, in my view at first sight, uh, but rather for the people who are contributing to public debate about this. Well, I fine. Please take it to the courts. But I, but I, I do think that um, this this is partly why I'm, I'm I really want us to think a little deeply. Um, this idea of what should law do is the immediate response, immediate response of any kind of uh, 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 standoff across lines of religious difference right now in our world. What should law do? Law should not do this, law should do this, let's take it to the law. Mm -hmm. do, do, we, do we need to just ponder what are the different kinds of injury at stake here? Or do we just basically decide this is an injury? It just means this, the, the neutral mechanisms of the law could be further expanded to include ever copiously more and more forms of injury. Or do we actually need to ponder, and I, 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 that's what I'm suggesting, that we do not really quite understand what is at stake here. Not just for Europeans, for Muslims themselves. And I think that's where the question that you were asking is relevant, right? What is, it, what is at stake here? What are the different ways of interpreting this injury? It are people who are saying, you insulted my symbols, I'll insult yours, this is my civilization, that's yours, let's do a contest of how badly I can stink up your symbols. Well, that's one way to go. Certainly some of the internet debate went that way. That's one response. But there is, there is a different kind of a response, and it doesn't happen to be just by, by ten individuals, it's quite ubiquitous. Do we need to think with that as theologians, as, as scholars of religion, as scholars of of a, a, a culture and anthropology and communication, do we need to ponder that? Or do we need to just go to the law and use the force of the law to make it more copious, as if the language of the law is itself neutral? Oh, totally point one. Ready. Second point, that the process of translation of this kind of moral injury, I'm arguing, is going to transform the very character of that injury. And a, that particular religiosity that is at stake here. Do we want to just recreate the world in the image and order of one singular form of modular form of religiosity that can find itself in the language of the law that follows a certain semiotic ideology, certain means of communication? I'm, again, I'm not declaring this to be yes or no. I'm just saying, can we stop and think? Which one is directly related to this 
discussion and which is in fact taking us elsewhere so we can organize a little debate. So who is directly relevant for this? You also joined this. So then you in the middle and then the gentleman and the other ones, I will come to you. <laughs> because, but I only want to continue in this debate closer and we open new points. Start over here, same with who are. the traditional. Um, yeah, I mean, it's much of my work is, in fact, very much geared towards critiquing the dichotomy of modern modernity and tradition. I mean, I just think it's the wrong tree to bark up against, right? Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's, it's an old debate. It's being settled. We know that it's a, it's a problematic construction. So I'm not equating pious to tradition. Um, but I, and I can gloss it as Uga Booga and it will yield the same problem, right? So pious is just a gloss over um, what I do think are very important differences in what it means to be religious. Um, it doesn't mean there is the liberal religiosity and there's the pious religiosity. I'm not opposing that at all. In fact, if you, as you have read my book, m much of my uh, what I try to track are debates within Islam about very different conceptions of what it means to be Muslim and the political and ethical conflicts that generates. Um, in, in this paper in particular, I am talking about two very different conceptions of religiosity. You can say, why aren't you talking about five or six? And I could, but I think for the sake of being consistent with an argument and trying to tr show a contrast, I think it's really productive for me to do that. So maybe you're hearing that as pious as traditional and liberal as modern. I mean, these pious people are living in Europe today in our contemporary time period. We can barely, we can, we have to think of them as contemporaneous to the problems of today and yet having a different perspective. Otherwise, what we end up doing is we end up reinventing the hegemony of the hegemonic framework by just translating them continuously into terms that make us feel like they're, you know, that's the problem of universal humanism, you know, everybody's like us. If we talk about difference, this is the legacy of the, the I think the problematic legacy of, of the aftermath of the writing of Orientalism, that to talk about difference is necessarily an anathema because then we essentialize difference. I'm sorry, we're living in a world where differences count in very problematic ways, so how are we going to deal with that is crucial. <coughs> Without really finding difference, of course. Following up chronologically with this, Sarah and the gentleman, and you. Let me close the book. So you, are, you are in the list because you're opening a new discussion. So I'm coming to both of you. On the board. Sarah. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to stand up because I feel I'm 
the language to be able to think politically with, with those kinds of interactions. Um, I mean, this was my preoccupation in my book in some ways. How do we think politically about ethical practices? What are the political effects of certain kind of ethical practices that don't even necessarily, their politics is not even legible to, to the ethical practitioners themselves, and yet they create a space of thinking differently about politics. Um, and I, I agree with you. I think uh, we do not have a very developed language about that. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think one can one can reflect on a moment in 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 uh, um, the gay and queer struggles in in the United States, um, where particularly before the onslaught of HIV and AIDS and the the, the aftermath of that and what it did to the communities. Um, in the United States, which is the case I know best in this, uh, is in the way in which there was an entire sort of set of practices that that uh, the gay community engaged in, sexual practices um, within public spaces of, of uh, erotic practices, various kinds of, of ways that displaced this um, utter cultural hold of heterosexuality, right? And it did it in ways that were not about simply gay identity, which is what then it became crystallized into, or a gay public discourse. I mean, the people who have written about it, the Signal article that I'm thinking of here is, of course, Lauren Berlant's and Michael Warner's article on sex in public places, which precisely looks at these sets of practices that are going on and, over, and which are not about claims on the state, give us our rights, give us our recognition. They're very different kinds of practices because they're aimed at transforming the cultural landscape on which sexuality is even imaginable, right? And, um, and they, they do very different kind of work. And, and of course, they become impossible as the identity politics of the gay movement crystallizes further and further and further. Right, to the point that, in fact, I mean, and there's again, there's much reflection on that that has been produced by queer studies on that moment of crystallization and its aftermath. And which is not just related to that gay identity crystallizes and its problem of identity politics, it's also very complicatedly related to, of course, what happens to, to sexual practices in the aftermath of both the morality police that is unleashed, uh, even, you know, particularly the backlash in the United States. Um, against the queer movement in public spaces, but also the AIDS epidemic. So I think there are parallels with which we can think. As I ask, me back to my before hot thing. Um, you spoke about this um, in, in reply to the question of Christoph. If you go to the law with a certain type of problem, 
the problem itself is changed in going through the wall because you have to play it then according to certain rules. Now maybe underneath there, I'm just testing intuition. Both the people who in this country and in my country, I live in Belgium, want to throw out the Muslims. They have this intuition, go damn it, they stay here, they will change us. And the same thing, but I, the name is gone, but there has been a very influential thinker in, Fran in uh, France who advised the Muslims living in France to go out of France again, to leave the country, because if you stay, he said, or he claimed, you will be changed. So there is a, this, this, there is this intuition that if you connect with one another in one way or another, simply by living in the same country, or for us listening to you or listening to other people, that, that brings about change and there is this very deep level there of fear. We don't want that kind of change because we will not know how to handle it. Change the hybridization or some sort of Yes, yes. But that's a very negative way of looking at it. That's what you mean. Quickly, because you already had several yes. questions, so I'm not coming back to you again. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that sociologically speaking, the uh, I think the person you're referring to is Sayyid Qutb, I think, in his writings, he had said that at one point. Um, I think sociologically speaking, the problem is that most of the Muslims you're learning in Europe don't want to leave. They regard themselves as Europeans. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question uh, that uh, they have no such desire, nor such, um, at least from what I understand from all the work that's being done on it. So the question becomes then, Who's asking them to leave? The, the desire doesn't come from within. So, in a sense, that the, the the logic of contamination is only goes one way. <laughs> Introduce yourself quickly. Yes, thank you. My name is Jaylan Bader. I'm a student uh, of world religions, and I'm also an author and an uh, uh, advisor on emancipation and Islam. Um, well, among of the much the main things you said were very interesting. Um, you, you, you talked about language and you talked about law, all, and, and it reminded me of an article that I just read. I'm sorry, my voice is low. Um, um, an art, I think it's from Marcel Mauss, but I saw you refer to him in your book, so I'm not sure that I remember it correctly, but I think it was on him. And he was uh, analyzing uh, mosque conflicts here in the Netherlands. We have, we have conflicts, uh, I think it was, but I'm not sure. Uh, it was, we have uh, conflicts for where new mosques are to be built, and uh, uh, the, the, the yeah, original inhabitants of neighborhoods don't like that, and then they protest against the mosques with the with the minaret and, and all the things. And and it seems that um, the only allowed discussion, the only arguments that are legitimate, are uh, arguments that are put in the framework of the policy of social geography. So if people say, you know, I'm not sure if we will have enough parking space here after the mosque has come, or, mm -hmm. or things like that. So only things within the policy or the law. But and other things, I'm afraid that maybe Muslims will take over in this uh, neighborhood. That's not, that's taboo. You can't say that in the debate. Mm -hmm. So because of that article, I'm now looking into the integration policy in the Netherlands and whether some subjects in the Islam debate maybe are mostly linked to the integration policy. And that, of course, it, 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 it brings us something because you frame your debate and that's okay, but of course it limits, uh, it limits the debate also and there is not enough language. And, and you were asking how should we then talk about moral injuries if we don't use law, uh, Juridical language, language or, or from policy makers. Um, and then I was thinking about, we had, in Rotterdam we had these city debates, and it was a series of debates throughout the year, maybe two years. In, in, in different neighborhoods, there are people who really speak out about everything, uh, Muslims and, and others together. And it's of course not, uh, then you are not, or yeah, it's not still making policy on moral injuries or moral ethics, but you are building on something mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. do, do you think it's comparable with what you were saying? Okay, let me give two annotations about the city of Rotterdam that you may remember as the theater of great political turmoil in the Dream for Town era. It now has the first officially appointed Muslim mayor in this country, mm -hmm. and the University of Rotterdam has as a permanent part-time visitor, Tariq Ramadan, mm -hmm. uh, trying to connect the city to I'm sure that the experiment is 
working, but we make progress. And that's interesting. Um, Marcel Mosa, I, I think there's a confusion here. He was Durkheim's uh, nephew, died a long time ago. But, uh, no, 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 that's not the point. Uh, that's not the gift, yeah. Um, uh, but I think what you're pointing to is... Marcel Mosa. Well, it's a Okay, yeah, I, I was just confused. I was following you on a different trajectory than I could change the trajectory. No, no, not at all. Um, I think the point you're raising, um, I'm not sure how translatable it is to the, to the sorts of questions I'm raising, but I think it's a very important one, which is to say that the kinds of struggles that are happening between, within communities, right, as a result of just people living together, right, having to figure out how they're going to make a life together, right, one doorway to the next doorway, one lane to next lane, Markets, places, places of worship, places of trade, places of commerce. How is this going to happen? Right? These are very practical problems, and I think what you're alluding to is the, the ways in which, oh, it's about parking spaces rather than I can't stand these people who come into my neighborhood, you know. So um, those problems, those practical problems of coexistence, and I think Sarah and I were talking about this on the train, that that's where a lot of the language is being worked out, right? Which is not just let me tell, uh, let me file a suit against you for discriminatory purposes. Well, likely the suit is going to get thrown out, which is, by the way, what happened to this uh, people who tried to bring the case uh, again with, uh, in the European Court of Human Rights against the newspapers that published the cartoons in the European Court of Human Rights. It was thrown out. So, uh, you know, people did, I, I, that's why I don't think that it, it, it works. <laughs> it doesn't work for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons it doesn't work is that these cases are not even entertained just for purely other reasons. So um, I think that's where the language has to come from. That's where the resources have to come from to think about how does this minutia of living together and, and creating a community despite these strong um, you know, boundaries, let's give them a neutral name here, um, how do people actually work with that and struggle with it? Um, my name is Tom Kronemek. I um, I'm not a practicing academic at the moment, but uh, okay, you. <laughs> working within the development sector, which might explain the nature of my question. It's actually you, you've already um, given several responses, so I'm simply repeating the point. I'm just then an attempt to, to push uh, push it maybe a little bit further. Um, I, I completely agree, and I recognise also from from your statements in your book and, and in other articles that. Now, the hesitation to, to, to foreclose the, the debate and the reflection uh, for the sake of, of immediate political action or, or turning to the law, etc. Um, in view of the fact that the, the transformation with, which you referred to earlier that, the, um, that, that is required to even start addressing um, uh, the way um, uh, our ethical and moral subjectivity should be transformed in order to respond to the kind of uh, feelings and injuries that, that come up as, as in the case of the cartoon issue. Um, that, that's perfectly understandable and I, I, I completely agree with that. At the same time, there is of course an urgency in the sense that these, when the, the debate on these issues is, is raging, we, we have um, the cartoon issue has already uh, been overtaken by, by a whole series of other mm -hmm. incidents. We, we've had our own uh, small and, and large incidents in Holland with the FITNA and, and mm -hmm. our dear Gail Bills and Thomas that we will get a suit. Your voice is getting emotional about it. Yes. Yeah. And of course we did have our, our occasional um, or even regular um, upheavals about what uh, Tariq Ramadan that this Martha has written about uh, uh, recently. So there is an urgency also on, 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 in, in sort of developing or at least responding to this in, in a more immediate political sense. Um, do you have any clues in, in what direction it should go? What, what, <laughs> what is to be done? <laughs> we always come back to that question. Um, I, I don't, I mean, I, I struggle in my own ways and I, I, I do what needs to be done in terms of what forms of alliances, what kinds of political actions one needs to take within the ground, on the ground. And I think that's really crucial. 
I mean, the kinds of struggles that you're talking about that are really totally immediate. They impinge upon, you know, your ability to actually be able to survive in the world as a moral human being that has a certain relationship to what's happening around you. Um, you know, I, I encounter that in raising a child in America as, as a mixed couple, right? And what does it mean? What does it mean to struggle with that child? Um, and to be able to impart to the community that what, what this hybridity means and what are the forms of discrimination that he encounters that you want to make legible to that kid and forms of discrimination that hopefully he will come into that you don't and cannot and do not want to make legible. So these are all sorts of things. I do think that it's crucial to be involved in those instances. I'm not arguing that let's just sit back in the armchair. And, but I do also realize that we often do not understand the inadequacy of our own actions because of the compulsion of the moment, um, because of the call for action. And, uh, and that was the place from which this was written. I mean, in a sense, if I can say so, this is in a lot of ways struggling against the very reading practices that I bring to this. You know, what are they agitating about? Why are the mother, these Europeans so racist? Why can't they understand what they're doing, right? I mean, there's this immediate resort to let's just settle the case. This is racism. This is, this is they're really upset, and so they're burning the cars. Or, and then you suddenly realize you're encountering an entire scale of humanity that is really perceiving this in a very different way, but is equally upset. What is the significance of, of, of this reaction? And are we capable of thinking with it, both ethically, politically, but for me, I suppose, analytically? Where does it come from? And where does it take us if we stay with it, rather than immediately glossing it, oh, this is religious anger? We've lost a lot as soon as we say this is religious anger. Because religion is just an umbrella term for such an intense set of disagreements about what it is, what kind of subject are we dealing with. Cesare, I'm, I'm a postdoc here in Utrecht, that's uh, the research institute for history and culture. And um, I uh, was in the Middle East, in Palestine specifically, uh, during the cartoon controversy. 
and uh, uh, working, doing field work within a very religious, non-traditional community. And actually, I have to thank you for your book because I read your book during that time and it, it really helped me not only to read that kind of space, but also to inhabit this very specific space. And something that really struck me, I remember it was 2006 that the team, the, about the, the team of the Danish, the Danish cartoon kept coming up in so many of my discussions, almost daily. And the interesting thing was that they kept coming up together with the Pope speech. Mm -hmm. So that at one point, and at one point this made me, uh, it was almost kind of an obsessive thing. Like it became like a daily debate, which also was particularly kind of unpleasant for me because of the implicit identification of myself as a European Christian that they were performing. But basically to come to my question, what at one point uh, I started thinking that this pairing of the Pope speech with the Danish cartoon, which I was interpreting at first as just two different expressions of Islamophobia. But at one point I started thinking kind of theoretically what it means, that kind of pairing, and that obsessive, rec like going back to this. And I was thinking of the, so why is that relevant? And I was thinking how the, that maybe that Pope speech was very much talking to kind of the relationship between like the Pope speech and the normative conception of religious within liberalism that constitute Islam as its other, so to speak. Which Pope speech is this? I'm sorry, I'm not Islam as its other. So I was thinking that, you know, this pairing, this, you know, con this very kind of frequent pairing of these two kind of discursive moments made me think of the relationship between the Pope speech uh, and kind of liberalism normative conception of religion and the debates about the, like, the current renegotiation of religion in Europe. I think it links to your earlier comment about Turkey being uh, excluded, excluded from the European Union on the basis <coughs> of, course, of, of, of this idea that it's not tolerant. And this idea of tolerance is, uh, you know, there's, again, um, there's some very interesting and good work that has been done on the notion of tolerance as not just an internal good to liberal democratic societies, but it is an, as, a, as a particular civilizational discourse in which the object of tolerance, the object who is tolerated is, is precisely the one who stands in a relationship of lesser power to the one who is tolerating. And how the whole language of tolerance is, in, particularly in this current moment, is very crucially linked to this discourse on civilizational difference, you know, we can tolerate them, but you cannot tolerate intolerance, right? This is the famous phrase of a number of neoconservatives. Um, and, um, you know, here I'm thinking of uh, Wendy Brown's book, who really takes apart this, this, uh, this discourse on tolerance in the way that it has emerged in the current discourse, and of course the civilizational other as actually now that it's, it, it's Islam and that really buttresses the self-identity of Europe. I think Ratzinger is a complicated figure in this. Um, I think on the one hand, um, the speech that you're talking about, it obviously very much is embedded in this discourse of civilizational other. I'm not entirely sure that this is where, you know, the whole, the idea of liberalism writ large begins to get complicated, right? Because on the one hand, and I think the person who's written very eloquently about this recently is, is Judith Butler, that in the way that on the one hand his Islamophobia and his reliance on the civilizational other of Islam as making therefore Christianity distinct, and in his phraseology it's actually Judeo-Christianity that's distinct, having just forgotten um, the contentious history between Judaism and Christianity. Um, uh, that, 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 the, the linkage of that too is, is profound consequences because of course he's against a lot of liberal precepts and values, right? Such as that of uh, the issue of paternity, the in, in issue of gay marriage and, and so on and so forth. So I think one needs to th think carefully um, because uh, for, for many true blue liberals, he is in fact not a liberal, right? And I think it's, and similarly as 
George Bush's White House was not a liberal White House, right? Um, for many, uh, for good reasons, there was this, this distinction drawn. And, and in fact, the, the neocons are not conservatives. They are distinctly different from the conservatives. So Pat Buchanan's agenda is very, very different. So I think it's important to retain those distinctions in mind when we speak of these formations. Um, otherwise, we end up you know, uh, collapsing what are, I think, very important places of struggle and places of alliances. Of Amsterdam, and in the in your camera. It's okay. okay. Uh, I have actually a question that comes back to the question that was asked at the beginning by the gentleman in the front, which is he asked why cartoons, and then you were rather quick to say, well, I think what's at stake here is Muhammad, not good cartoons, and I would like to maybe ask you to uh, think about this a bit more because I was really uh, I'm intrigued by the notion because you're so much talking about language and meaning and about translations between different sorts of language, I think, wouldn't it be possible that precisely because they are cartoons, there is this sort of ambivalence or this sort of gap or slipperiness of the meaning that allows for the sort of imposing of more sorts of meaning on <coughs> cartoons and other things. And I'm also thinking, for instance, what happened during the discussion that immediately was said that, no, because in the Middle East, it's always, cartoons are always supposed to be insults and also museums. There's a museum that says the cartoons are always insults. And also you cited a very interesting example of this person. I'm not sure if I can cite it exactly. There's that the cartoons making about the factual connection between a certain kind of Islam, I think it was, in terrorism. And if I recall these cartoons well, I think there's maybe one or two that make this connection in some sort of way. So there is this sort of slipperiness about this, the cartoons. And wouldn't that contribute to this sort of uh, flurry of meaning making and interpretation that maybe makes it more uh, useful or usable for a controversy, maybe than other sorts of speech. Also, given the sort of order is chair, there is a contradiction uh -huh. in your question between saying there is something intrinsically offensive in cartoons in their satirical function, which uh -huh. is historically centuries year old in our secular. Mm -hmm. uh, European cartoons of the 18th century and, and argue at the same time that they are slippery. Oh, I, I mean, there is I'll nothing slippery but an image of the Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. with a, you know, a dynamite stick in, in his turban. It's, 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 it's absolutely zero. So what, which way do you want to carry your question? I don't, think, I don't think I was trying to say that they were intrinsically uh, offensive. I think especially even these cartoons, uh, there is a slipperiness in the meaning. Uh, people were saying this is not Muhammad or this is... Uh, all Muslims, or this is irony, and then there are a number of cartoons, and some of them were quite different from that. So don't you see there is, at least it opens up the possibility for imposing more sorts of meanings on cartoons than maybe other forms of communication? This is probably are you other. saying that, in fact, there was a factual connection between terrorism and Muslims, and that's what the cartoons were eliding? It's quite the opposite. Ah. Quite the opposite. I'm sorry if I'm not making myself clear. I'm trying to say that there is this ambiguity in the in the cartoons that maybe open. What is up the ambiguity? I'm the, sorry, I'm the, not understanding the point of ambiguity. I guess like Rosie. Okay, I think there is a, a sort of ambiguity in the in the fact that they are cartoons, that they are a genre that maybe can, that maybe opens up possibilities for saying this is just a joke. We're not saying this with something else. Uh, there's uh, we're not. Uh, there, so there is a certain yeah. ambiguity in the in the genre. I think that's, that's what I'm trying to say. To yeah. The grid by which we would read yeah. those cartoons mm -hmm. as potentially you know, a facetious, comical mm -hmm. rendition of a dramatic situation. Mm -hmm. The grid of legibility, the hermeneutical grid, is very culture specific, mm -hmm. as irony always is, as satire always is as Sigmund Freud teaches us, jokes always are. What is very, very funny, Belgian jokes, and, uh, in certain contexts, are really not in Belgium, where you find the same jokes against Italian, by the way, okay, this is the story. So it's about the grid of intelligibility, I mean, that is what Professor Mohamed was trying yeah, to I, tell us I'm aware about the culture specificity of this. So maybe that's the way I could turn the question to make it possible, and would be 
Would you be happy with this potential translation of your question? No. I'll try to <laughs> Where that there is a cultural grid. What I'm trying to say is that cartoons as a genre, I'm just hypothesizing, but maybe cartoons as a genre, because it seems to me there was a flurry of different attempts to impose meanings on these cartoons and debates on what they actually meant. And might, I, might I attempt an answer? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I think this is precisely what I was trying to point to. We get into the slippery slope of, well, this is their meaning and this is our meaning. We just really meant fun things and they just misunderstood the fun of it, you know, they got so serious about it and don't you understand that's what cartoons do, cartoons are about irony and satire and we poke fun at our own images and, and our own, um, you know, wonderful, um, you know, sacred figures and so what, we're not doing it about yours, what's the big deal, but you see the slippery slope of the meaning argument and this is precisely why I'm trying to analyze the discourse of meaning, right? It's a different level of analytical exercise here, which is to say, how did we first come upon this notion that it is all about different meanings? Mm -hmm. And if we remain within the schema of, the, of meaning, mm -hmm. is their meaning versus our meaning versus the genre meaning versus the intentionality of the cartoonist meaning, then I think we don't get a different analytical perspective. Because then we can, be, you and I can be here till you know, till cows come home, and we will still be saying, well, but the guy who drew it meant something different, and the guy who read it over there meant something different. Can we just get out of this hall of mirrors just for a moment and consider by what fiat did we begin to think of meaning as the primary act that has taken place here, and reflect on something else? Just, just a simple question. I'm not, I'm not at all trying to tell you how you should think. And that actually what the cartoons are about is not meaning. Please, let me be very clear. I'm not saying it's, we, we have been sitting here and talking about the meaning of cartoons in some ways, right? Yes, so I'm not telling you to not think in a certain way. I'm just think, saying let's just reflect on this consensus that the point of, 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 of uh, analysis lies in the different ideas of meaning. So I'll just close here. <laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to um, attempt a conclusion by going back to the history of this lecture series. You probably do not know that the, oh, you may know, that the speaker just before you was Charles Taylor. Uh -huh. uh, two, two, two weeks ago, you can again go to the archive and listen to his um, lecture. But the first year that we started this lecture series as an attempt to get the three sections of our faculty, philosophy, theology, and the arts, to speak to each other, and in response to the dramatic social events in Dutch society, Harvard must deliver the big nexus lecture in the presence of 1,100 people. And there was a line running on in the public discussion about secularism, which is that the Christian religion of Christianity as a whole engenders, produces, and historically encourages the production of secular society. So we have to be indebted to Christianity for being the only religion, actually, uh, the one religion that has historically allowed what Christian what Taylor calls a secular society. So there is this kind of, I think is as good as the secular discourse gets in this country, I think, in Europe as a whole. It seems to me that this, this assumption that you're questioning in your work, both in the politics of piety and in the paper of today, and I'm sure in the paper of, um, uh, of Leuven. Um, and I think one of the sentences from your paper today, that the secularism such as we know it, actually has yielded a number of normative social techniques that reshape our understanding of what religiosity is. And again, in your ask questions and answers this afternoon, uh, that a lot of us fail to see the assumed and implicit models about religiosity that are at the heart of our understanding of both religion and secularism. So when Ratzinger says Christianity is the only religion that has an implicit link to reason, and because of this implicit link to reason, it can produce secular society, it is really enacting a form of religiosity. I think your work forces us to see this, opens us, this is gentle and sophisticated and erudite argument, my question to you would be, what would you, both methodologically, politically, and theoretically, hint at as a possible solution? Should we pluralize our understanding of forms of religiosity? Should we pluralize the modes of secular practices that emerge from them? So we could have a multiple models of multiple 
secularism, or should we uh, look at something more fundamental? If so, what? And where would you go looking for the answers? Do you go out empirically and talk to people and say, what kind of secular person are you? Uh, or are you conceptual, even a visionary spiritual mode? Thank you for that question. Um, I think the problem uh, in the current discussions on secularism lies in wanting to define what secularism is. Wanting to stabilize it, give it a definition, and in a sense, the most, one of the obviously most uh, erudite attempts at that have come from Charles Taylor, A Secular Age. Um, I find that project uh, problematic for two reasons, which then, it, by way of that, uh, an answer, I will come through that, those problematizations. One is that in that account, European Christianity's encounter with its others, its Jews, it, the, the non-Muslims that, that Christianity, Latin Christendom, his object of analysis, ruled over completely falls to the wayside. This is not just a problem of inclusion. Because I think then we remain in the same problematic of let's, this idea that inclusion means let, letting, just including more data into the same paradigm. What it raises is the question, the encounter that Christianity had historically with its others, whether it's, it's others within uh, Judaism itself, or through its colonial missions, whether it was in Latin America, whether it's in, middle, in the Middle East or in South Asia, those encounters fundamentally transformed Christianity. They didn't just assimilate it, they didn't just kept, change the nature of these traditions, they actually were transformed from within in their colonial encounter. How do we think about that Christianity? And its, its, its impetus to power from within that is constitutive of it, there is no language of it in, in that analysis. Secondly, I think in its attempt, in its very erudite attempt, to try to think about what is the secular, which is primarily for him is a form of subjectivity, Right? It's a phenomenology of, deep phenomenology of a secular religious subjectivity. The attempt is to try to demarcate what is properly religious in a secular society. The entire idea of belief with the possibility of non-belief. That idea, I'm not saying it's incorrect, but to simply regard it as descriptive of the world that we are observing is to not recognize that that is precisely the power of secularism in reproducing the very subjectivities that it recognizes as a normative and internal to itself. So all those who do not fall with, who do not somehow ascribe to this kind of religiosity fall outside of the ambit of secularism. I think this is not just simply an error, a descriptive error. This is precisely where the power of the norms comes from. Because those who fall outside of the ambit of secularism who cannot even be understood, they are either understood to be traditional religionists, fundamentalists, we can go down the list and we can give them names. The marginal religiosities that cannot be accounted for within the notion of secularism, within is the normative power of secular rationality to remake those who do not abide by its claims in its own image. So my methodology, therefore, if you will, or my larger the impetus where I think my own work comes from, is to go to the places where secularism becomes a contested object. Those moments of instability, struggle, political struggle, ethical struggle, uh, struggle over, maybe, be it over sexuality, gender, and try to understand this normative impetus within I'm, and I'm, I would be very specific within liberal secularism, and I'm not talking about socialist secularism or communist secularism, liberal secularism. The normative impetus, when it asserts itself, whether it asserts itself through the power of the state, or it asserts itself through a set of reading practices, hegemonic reading practices, certain hegemonic sexual norms, gender norms, and so on, those moments are of insight into the character of the secular. They're not simply to be thought as outside of the secular, but in fact, that's that it is precisely through those struggles that we begin to see the the claims of normative claims and uh, of secularism, which shift, which have shifted historically. They don't remain stable. 
the presence of Muslims was not as contested of a force pre-9-11 as it becomes a contested force post-9-11 in Europe. That event matters historically. And therefore, the struggle over what is properly religious and what is not within European societies changes, therefore. So for me, that would be the point of interrogation. And in a sense, but it can't just be an empirical investigation. It has to be a philosophical reflection as well, because so much of our philosophical categories are infused with these empirical suppositions. So to how do we think within and without philosophy is part of the struggle. And I wish philosophy could hear this. Join me in thanking our brain speakers.